bring up John 5, 1 through 9. Can we stand for the reading of the word, please? Mine might be a little bit different than what you see because we did not have the ESV, and what I'm getting ready to read you is from the ESV version. Sometime later, Jesus went to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there was in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic Aramaic is called Bethesda. Bethesda means mercy or grace, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades or porches. Five is also the number of grace. Here's a great number of disabled people, and they used to lie here, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. For an angel of the Lord went down at an appointed seasons into the pool and moved and stirred the water. Whoever was then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in, was cured of whatever disease he had. One who was there had been there an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and learned that he had been in the condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied. You see, he didn't even know who Jesus was. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. When, while I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, rise, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. You may be seated. People look at the finished product, but there's always a process. Everyone has a process. Everybody wants a testimony, but they don't want the test. The man was healed. He took his mat and he walked. Somebody say, rise up and walk. Luke 2 tells us that Jesus, when he was 12 years old, with his parents, he was at a feast. They found him at the temple because they lost him. Uh, So we know that this wasn't Jesus' first time going, right? He went to the festival every year. If you are a Jewish male, it is mandatory for you to go to the festivals. So we know that for 38 years, Jesus had been going to the festival. Or not 38 years, I'm sorry. But for the years that he was alive, Jesus had been going to the festival. Jesus had been passing by this man year after year. The scriptures say a great number of people lie there. They just was laying around. Let me tell you, everybody is doing it. There's a great number of kids, young adults, they're all hanging together. They're all doing it. But I'm going to tell you that sometimes you've got a great number of people all doing the wrong thing, all feeding off of each other because they feel that complacency within each other. Why did Jesus focus on just this one man? Because there was a great many people that he could have saved. One man. He didn't heal the whole crowd. He focused his attention on just this man. You know, maybe Jesus could see that the man was ready to give up. Maybe he could see the condition of his heart, which is something we can't see. But all I know is that God's sovereign plan is much bigger than any human condition or situation that you are going to be in. My message today is about the man focusing on the wrong thing. He focused on getting into the pool. His deliverer, his healer, had been walking past him all those years, and he never saw him because he was focused on getting into that pool. While other people are celebrating, 
We got a sick club over here. People going to the festival, they're happy, they're celebrating. But over here is the sick club. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. You ever notice how misery kind of loves company? How water kind of seeks its own level? You know, when you're not feeling good, you want somebody to say, I'm so sorry. I, 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 I am so sorry you're not feeling well. I am so sorry that you're feeling like you're feeling. I'm going to tell you that's the wrong people to be around. You do not want somebody in your life that will agree with you in your time of misery. You want somebody in your life that when you are in a time of despair or you are in a trial, you want somebody in your life that will come up and say, let me help you up out of this situation, not feel sorry for you. So we had this sick club over here, and they're all feeling sorry for themselves. But our, our warfare is not always natural. We can dress it up, cover it up. We can put makeup on it. We can make it look good so other people around us can't see what's really going on. Instead of the blind, we have the bitter. Instead of leprosy, we walk around with jealousy. We're not walking around paralyzed physically, but life has thrown us so many hits that instead of paralyzing us, it has demoralized us. We do have the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, the angry, the insecure, the jealous, the bitter, the frustrated, the depressed, the oppressed, the suppressed. We have all of it. But sometimes you can't see it. Sometimes it's a condition that you can't see on the outside. And you can smile all you want to at that person. It does not help their heart. It does not change their condition. It do, that is not what they need. What they need is the word of God. What they need is the deliverer. God forbid <laughs> that we would become so comfortable in our dysfunction and comfort that we would not see our Savior and Redeemer walking by. Jesus had been coming there for years. The man had lived all of his life as an invalid. In other words, he was invalid, ineffective, and useless. You see, I can preach this sermon because I've been there. It's not that I'm insensitive because the man was sick. Trust me, I know what it's like to be sick. I know what it's like to pray every day and expect a miracle, thinking you're going to get it. I know every day what it's like to go to bed with pain, to wake up with pain. For 13 years, pain was my constant companion. A lot of you don't know me. That You didn't know me back in that day. But back in that day, back in that day, I walked with a cane. I walked sometimes with a walker. <laughs> Glory to God. Jesus. I could not wash my dishes. I could not vacuum my floor. I could not walk out to the mailbox by myself. I could not take care of my family, and I couldn't even take care of myself. My husband helped me get in and out of the shower and to get dressed. Thirteen years. Praise God, it wasn't 38. Thirteen years. We can come, we become complacent in a position where we can get stuck. We can get stuck with things around us thinking that this is all the better it's going to get, when in reality, it's already gotten better. We have not grasped the vision or the, re the revelation of what has already taken place. Because once you grasp it, trust me, you rise up and you walk. And that's what Jesus did for me. I rose up and I walked. Praise God. Oh... This man was recognized by his condition, 
not his position in Christ, but by his condition. You know, there are shorter messages and verses in the Bible where it gives you the name of the person. We have a whole message on this man, and it doesn't even say his name. He was known by his condition. Hmm. You know, a lot of people live in the past. And I've got to tell you, young people, you've got to learn now and not wait till it's 20 years down the road. What is your position in Christ? Where is that deliverer walking past? Are you grabbing hold? Are you saying, I'm looking for you. I need you. I waited long, too long, before I put myself in that position. You don't have to put yourself in that position. You have a choice to turn to Jesus and say, I'm going to make you the Lord of my life, the author and the finisher of my faith. And I'm going to do it young. I'm going to do it early in my life instead of wasting my life going after what I want, going after my dream, going after building my kingdom, going after, going after. You see what? It doesn't matter. Everything that you're dreaming of is some form of a material thing. It will all be gone one day. And what is left is the spirit man that lives in you. And how will that spirit man be when Jesus Christ comes back? How will he see your heart? People in your past know you. They know the stuff you've done. They know that you didn't do things quite so good and maybe you did some bad things. Yeah, I did. You know, I had a past too. But you are not the people, that person anymore. Whatever they say about you in the past, whether you were an ex-husband, an ex-wife, an ex-con, an ex-murderer, an ex-thief, an ex-employee, an ex, an ex, an ex, an ex. You know what Jesus Christ did? He took the ex, he turned it upside down, he made it a cross. He put himself on it. He said, it is finished. I have called you out. He did it. You don't have to do it. All you have to do is accept it. Ah, oh, praise you, Jesus. Mm, I don't want to be called anything of my past. But I do want to be called what God calls me. See, God has a name for you. And you want to be called what God calls you. Because you see, me, I am a child of the Most High God. I am a Bible-preaching, Scripture-quoting, devil-kicking woman of God. That's what I want to be known as. I don't want to be known for my past. I want to be known for what I am right now in Christ. You know, we have a jealous God. He doesn't want anybody to get his credit. He, if you're waiting around for someone, see, guy says, I had no one to help me get into the pool. Who was going to help him? You had a whole mess of blind, lame, crippled people. Who was going to help him? If you are waiting around for somebody to help you, you're going to be waiting a long time because Jesus Christ is the only person that can help you. And when you come to that realization, then you will be on the line to victory. You know, everything is a choice in life, no matter what you do. I choose to pick up this paper. I choose to walk over here. I choose. It's my choice. We all have a choice. God gave us that choice. And being offensive is a choice. Do you know I don't read anywhere in the Bible where Jesus became offensive? They spit on him. They, they tortured him. They called him a liar. They threw him out of towns. They told him to leave. We become offensive at the least little thing. And let me tell you, I am preaching to the choir. All right? So I am not pointing my finger at anybody. Because I'm going to tell you, we have a choice. 
When somebody says something to us, oh, I don't think she likes me. Did you hear the way she said that to me? Oh, did you hear what that person said about me? Why would they say that? I didn't do that. Did you hear what they told my teacher? That was a lie. Did you hear what that boy said about me? Did you hear what my boss said about me? You see, everything they say is not you. That is not you. You need to find out who you are in Christ. You need to find out that you are the head and not the tail. That you are the righteous that's sitting at the right hand of God. That you have an inner Holy Spirit that leads you and guides you in all truths. You have got to choose not to be offensive. Because it is a choice. And it is something that God does not like. And anything that is not for God is against God. And if it's against God, it's a sin. So that little thing that we call offense, ooh, my hair got up, oh, you know what? Let it go. Drop it. Get past it. You know what? Go on. If you're waiting for somebody to ask you forgiveness for something that they might not even realize they did, you're going to be waiting a long time. Just drop it. Were you forgiven? Forgive them. Forget what they say about you. Forget what they say. That is not you any longer. It is not you. Jesus, Jesus. You know, life can be so humbling. I used to look at this man a little differently than I look at him now. Because, you know, I used to say, well, 38 years, you'd think that by now he would figured out a way to get in that pool. I mean, even if he rolled a little bit or nudged himself, wouldn't you think at 38 years that man could have figured out a way to get to the pool? You know, sometimes we're just comfortable. We become comfortable. And do you know that Satan doesn't care if you're comfortable? As long as he can lull you to sleep to make you invalid, ineffective, and useless, he will let you be as comfortable as you want to be. He doesn't care. Nobody can do it by themselves. We all have to have somebody. But you've got to stop calling 911 mama, 911 friend, 911 neighbor, and you've got to go to the Almighty God. He is the only one that can do it. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, when you're at your very lowest point, when you think, oh, I can't go on, oh my gosh, I've been in this trial so long, I've been walking through this pain for so long, I just can't do it. Lord, you've got to do something, you've got to do something. When you are at your wit's end, that is when the I am that I am does show up. When you say, I have given it to you and I'm no longer going to try to fix it myself, the I am that I am, the I am that I am says, I am here. I am here. He says, I am Jehovah. I am Jehovah Jireh, I am your provider. I am Jehovah Rapha, I am your healer. I am Jehovah Nisi, I am your victor. I am Jehovah, I am God. I stand alone. I don't need anybody's help and I don't need their permission to bless you. I can bless you all by myself. I can bless you without anybody. I can do it. He does not need your permission. He doesn't need anybody's permission. So he asks, he says, do you want to be made well? I'm thinking, Lord, who doesn't want to be made well, right? I mean, that to me was a question. Do you want to be made well? You see, this man was not only crippled in his body, but he was crippled in his mind. He saw himself as an invalid. His focus was, okay, if only I could get there. Maybe tomorrow I'll get there. Maybe next week I'll get there. No, he was crippled in his mind. Hallelujah. I know how hard it is to walk through pain. I know how hard it is to look 
past what you see in the mirror. I know how hard it is. But what I found is that faith is active. The Lord says, without works, your faith is dead. Well, what does the word works mean? It means actively involving mental or physical effect done in order to achieve something. You got a part here. It's not all up to Jesus. Jesus done paid it. He's a, and now it's, you, got, you got a part. You have something you have to do. You know, God told me this year is the year of restoration, revelation, and separating the wheat from the tares. I saw a vision about two weeks ago when I was in prayer. I saw a highway with a double yellow line. Then I saw a highway with a solid line and a broken passing line. And then I saw a highway with just one line straight down the middle. And God said to me this, that's my people. They cannot continue to walk a double life with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. They cannot continue walking with me one day and not the next. Picking and choosing what they will do when they do it and how they will do it. Constantly skipping from one thing to another. Picking and choosing what they will believe. Intimacy takes work. It takes time. You must get to know me inside and out. I have left all the tools that are needed for my people to receive the blessings they expect and want me to. One of me. They must be single-minded. They must keep their eyes on the mark. The prayers that, uh, that they want answered will not be unless they keep their eyes on me. They can walk a straight line, but only in the power and authority I have provided them. I am the mark. I am the mark, saith God. There is going to be a year of physical actions. You know, you can quote scripture all day long. <clears throat> I did it for 13 years. You can teach a parrot to quote the Bible. You can teach him. But if there is no action and faith behind that, you're not going to see what you want as your results. You cannot teach a parrot to walk in faith. But God has left you the keys to be able to do that. I didn't get a full revelation of my healing and what it was going to take for me to get it. And that's why it took me 13 years. I have learned in this, that physical action backs up the faith that is instilled in your heart. That's what brings about miracles. Praise God. You know, I couldn't sit, walk, or lay down for any extended periods of time. I had to take sleeping pills to do that. My entire day was consumed with, with getting up, sitting in the chair, walking around the perimeter of my dining room, living room, and foyer, laying down, then it started all over again. I couldn't do anything. I went from being a very active woman. I could fly a plane, I could ski, I could skate, I could work, I could sit at the computer all day long. I could sit on the floor with my grandchildren. I could play. I could jump around. I could bring home the bacon and fry it up in the pan for all of y'all that remember that little jingle. <laughs> but I lost all my independence. I became the invalid. I did not know how I was going to get out of that situation, and I was a Christian. Because the doctors told me that my neck and back were so bad that any little minor incident would paralyze me and put me in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. <laughs> but God. But 
God. You see, this man was focused on the wrong thing. His eyes were focused on getting in the pool instead of his deliverer that was walking by. That's where his focus should have been. I was very depressed. I considered suicide many times. I had the means to do it. I was opioid tolerant. What does that mean? I was addicted to prescription drugs given to me by my doctor, but nevertheless, I was addicted. I wore a fentanyl patch, 100 milligrams. You're supposed to change that every three days. I changed mine every day and a half. And sometimes I'd actually cut it and ooze out the gel, and I'd rub it on my body because I could not get rid of the pain fast enough. I was on Percocet, strongest morphine, the strongest. I was on morphine. I was on, oh my God, I was on 20 prescription medications a day, and a lot of them were opioids. That was the only way I could literally function. I could not get out of bed until I'd taken my medicine. I felt I was a burden to everybody. Like I had no worth, like I was good for nothing. <laughs> Your faith must always be in an expectation mode. It cannot be for, oh, in this sweet by and by, down the road it's going to come to me. Oh, no. It's got to be now. It's got to be right now because Jesus Christ paid it. He is not coming back to pay it again. He's already given you everything that he's going to give you. Now you have to learn how to walk in it. Ah, physical actions. Every sin and every miracle in the Bible had a physical action attached to it. You know, I looked... Jesus asked the question, do you want to be made well? The man never answered him. I, I read forwards, backwards, all over. I, I couldn't find anywhere where the man had answered him. But the Lord says, if you humble yourself, I will lift you up. If you sow, you will reap. If then, if then, I, I was looking for a place where he qualified. Jesus told a woman, your faith has made you well. Where was the man's faith? I don't know. doesn't tell us and we can't see it. But I realized he never answered Jesus. What I do know is that he was a man that was an invalid. He was laying at the pool of Bethesda, which is the house of grace, divinely positioned under the five colonnades, which are the pillars of grace, Jesus Christ, the Savior, walking past on the way to the festival, stopped. Jesus is grace himself because we live in his divine dispensation of grace today. There is grace upon our lives. And God is doing something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. You all ever hear the old saying, God helps those who help themselves? It's a lie. You know that? It's a lie. Because, you know what? <laughs> it is a lie. <laughs> it is not scriptural. That is true. But if you, could, if you could help yourself, you wouldn't need him to help you. So none of us are in a position like that. What I do know is that our Savior stopped to give this man grace. He comes to him and he says, do you want to be made well? Before he could answer, before the angels could descend, before the water was stirred, <laughs> Jesus said, get up, rise and walk. He did not need the help of the angel. He did not need the water stirring. He, all he needed was for that man to say, I believe what he says. You don't earn it. 
We surely didn't deserve it. But God, after you are done doing everything that you can do, is when you are going to see the I am that I am show up. Because you see, you got to let it go. Sometimes, sometimes we just want to hold on. We just want to see how we can do it ourselves. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I'm that personality type that I, I know I can get it done. I, you know, I'm going to make a spreadsheet, and I'm going to see how Jesus did it here, and I'm going to see how Jesus did it here, and then I'm going to figure out how I can do it here. How I... No, 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 no. It's called grace for a reason. It is called grace for a reason. My prayer for you today would be that you would rise up. You'd rise up in your finances, that you'd rise up in your ministry, you'd rise up in your business, you would rise up out of, uh, out of bad health, that you would rise up. Jesus is Messiah. The devil is a liar. Why did you think that he t Jesus told him to take his mat? He said, rise up, take your mat, and walk. Why do you think he told him to take his mat? After 38 years, don't you think it had been kind of dirty and stinky? I just want to be kind of, all right, you just leave it there. <laughs> Jesus wants you to recognize that the thing that once held you down the, the thing that once had control over your life, the thing that bound you, you now have control over it. You now control the situation. It no longer binds you. It can no longer hold you back. But I think there might have been one other reason that Jesus told him to pick up that mat too. Because you know what? If he left the mat... He could go back and pick the mat up. He could go back to that mat, couldn't he? If he took the mat with him, there wasn't anything to go back to. Look at the, pe look at the Israelites coming out of Egypt. My gosh, he sent flies, boils, locusts. He sent all of those, all of the things that he sent to them, right? Sent them out. He made sure <laughs> they had nothing to go back to. They brought everything out with them telling you when God delivers you, you take it all. You pack your toothbrush. You pack your clothes. You delete that phone number. You delete the GPS address. Give yourself some help. Don't go back to the thing that bound you. Don't go back to the thing that has control over your life. Give yourself some help. Oh, you know what? I'll bet you that man, while he was walking down the street with his mat, he was saying, I look good, but I didn't always look this good. I look good, but you don't know where I came from. I look good. He's saying, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He touched my body. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Praise you, Jesus. He saved me. He saved me. Hallelujah. He saved me. He saved you. He saved you. You know, I prayed and fasted today, uh, this, this week, trying to figure out what the Lord wanted me to tell you because this wouldn't have been my first message for you. But there's somebody here today that this message is for. Somebody here today that has been controlled by something that you should be controlling. Something that binds you, that you need to be loosed from. I don't know what it is in your life. All I know is that you're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. You know, when we say, Holy Spirit, come in here and have your way, those are not empty, idle words. They go to the throne room. He says that nothing comes back void. Nothing. You need to rise up. You need to pick up your mat. And you need to walk on. Amen. You, whatever that thing is, it might be your job. It might be your boss. 
It might be your house. It might be your car. It might be anything. Whatever it is, there is an answer in the kingdom of God for it. There is nothing that you will ever go into, nothing you will ever experience that Christ did not give you a way out. He gave you the word. It is your responsibility to get in there, dwell in the word, read it, and get it. You know, his responsibility, our pastor, is not to walk your walk. Moses' responsibility was not to walk the walk for the Israelites. Moses' responsibility was to lead them and guide them. That's his responsibility. Your responsibility as a Christian, if you want victory in your life, it's not because you're not getting it from him. It's because you're not dwelling in the, in the word enough and pulling it out and soaking it up like a sponge and finding out the revelation that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. What is it that you need? All you have to do is ask. Jesus told this man, rise up at once. He didn't say in two weeks, yesterday, tomorrow. He, he didn't say any of that. Rise up at once. Do you want your situation changed? If you want your situation changed, then you have got to get serious about it. Nobody can do it. I, I've been with my husband 44 years. I can't walk his walk. I, can't be, have, I can have faith and pray and exhort him. I can lift him up. I can't walk the walk. And when he gets before Jesus Christ for, for God our Savior, he can't say, well, Bonnie didn't pray for me enough. Yeah. Bonnie didn't walk with me enough. My pastor didn't tell me that. It is not anybody's responsibility but yours to find out. And I'm going to tell you there's somebody here tonight, today, that is definitely walking with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And God said, you will not be blessed like that. You will not. You can't be in the kingdom one moment and out of it the next. Either you're for me or you're against me. You choose. You have the choice. You choose. And God is telling you today to choose. What will you choose? What will you choose? Amen.